I'm Dr. Stuart Eaves and I work for Surrey Satellite Technology where I'm one of the people who describes himself as an ideas guy and tries to think up new missions for satellite systems. What I'd like to talk about now is some of the newest trends in spacecraft design. But just to put the presentation into context, I'd like to briefly run through some of the key satellite technologies to start. Uh, so I hope that will provide a bit of an introduction to uh, the area of satellite design. And then I'll talk about some of the trends that we're seeing in small satellites at the moment and then switch to looking a little further ahead into the future. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about risk and resilience at the end of the presentation, which is an area that's starting to um, influence the design of spacecraft as we become more reliant on our satellite systems. Potentially, we have to put more effort into uh, preserving those systems against the hazards and threats that they face. So to start with satellite technologies, um, these are the sort of critical satellite functions uh, that you'd have to perform and I'm going to step through each of these uh, in turn uh, to describe uh, some of the design um, features that they introduce for uh, a spacecraft system. So one of the first things that your spacecraft is going to uh, encounter during its mission uh, is the launch phase. Um, this is the most mechanically stressing uh, element. The launch vehicle will vibrate the uh, satellite mechanically and it'll also impose quite a lot of acoustic load. It's quite loud in the fairing of a launch vehicle. Uh, so potentially you have to design your spacecraft to withstand those loads and um, you each different launch vehicle has a different vibration spectrum and you can, if you know the vibration spectrum, design a structure that doesn't resonate at the particular frequency of the launch vehicle that you're planning to use. But one of the issues that Surrey Satellite Technology have faced over the years is because we're launching relatively small spacecraft, we tend to be uh, hitchhiker payloads, secondary payloads on many launch vehicles. And as a result, we don't start out when we are originally designing the mission with a knowledge of which vehicle we'll definitely be flying on. So what this has led us to do is to design spacecraft structures that are able to cope with uh, the vibration loads imposed by a variety of different launch vehicles. As you might imagine, that leads to uh, a design that is perhaps over-designed for any given launch vehicle, but is nevertheless able to withstand uh, the vibration effects of many different vehicles, which means that uh, we can choose which launch vehicle we eventually uh, go into orbit on. There are occasions where the payload of the mission um, actually demands that we do even more in terms of mechanical design. Uh, the satellite illustrated uh, on this slide is a mission called TopSat. Uh, which had a very sophisticated three-mirror astigmatic uh, camera. And uh, um, an important feature of that is that three-mirror astigmatic designs are quite hard to align. So the spacecraft had to um, essentially have its focus locked down before launch. And the last thing we wanted was for the launch vehicle to shake the mirrors out of alignment during the launch phase. So uh, what we did in this case was inserted uh, a, uh, an interface between the launch vehicle and the satellite itself, um, which is called a soft ride system. Uh, the um, technical definition of it is uh, a soft ride system. When it was described to me first, it was called a set of magic rubber washers. Uh, the magic uh, is choosing uh, the right rubber material so that it damps out the vibrations of the launch vehicle rather than turning the whole system into a trampoline and making the vibration si situation much worse. The satellite will arrive in space and then obviously you need to be able to convince yourself that the satellite will operate successfully in a vacuum. 
Um, we take an awful lot of components from the terrestrial microelectronics world and they're in general not designed to operate in vacuums, they're designed to operate in mobile phones and laptop computers etc. Um, and some of the packaging of those devices is inappropriate for the space environment, the materials outgas when they get into a vacuum environment. It's important to make sure that anything that does outgas on your spacecraft doesn't end up coating your optics and making the, uh, the system not function properly. And so we conduct tests in vacuum chambers on the ground to try and make sure that we're not using inappropriate materials before we launch. All satellites are going to need power and most satellites these days, uh, especially ones in orbit around the Earth, use solar panels. Um, as we've moved from uh, silicon-based uh, semiconductors to gallium arsenide, the efficiencies of those solar cells has improved with the result that we can do more with the satellite because for a given array area we have more power. Um, a lot of satellites um, have steerable solar arrays. That isn't so often the case for the mi uh, missions that we've built at Surrey. We've tended to use body-mounted solar panels um, which allow the satellites to have considerably more agility than their bigger cousins. Um, that obviously limits, to some extent, the amount of power you're able to generate on the spacecraft, but um, we found that the trade-off works in our favour in many cases. Uh, the mission illustrated on the lower left of this slide is the uh, NASA Juno mission, uh, which is heading out to Jupiter at the moment. Um, you'll notice that it has solar panels. Uh, it's the first mission to go uh, beyond Mars that actually has solar panels and uh, uh, it's uh, a consequence of the improving technology. Uh, all previous missions that have gone to the outer solar system have used radioisotope thermal generators to create their power and uh, that is a technology that uh, has its limitations, not least in the supply of the radioactive material which decays, generates heat and is used to power the spacecraft. So this is a, a concept that's being looked at in Europe at the moment. Um, uh, we don't have nuclear power in space in Europe at the moment, but um, although the American RTGs that have been used in the past have used uh, plutonium uh, as the radioactive element, uh, Europe actually has uh, a potential source in an element called am americium, uh, which is in uh, various waste stockpiles, uh, some of which are held in the UK, which could be extracted and turned into fuel pellets that would similarly generate heat and therefore power spacecraft. So we might be able to do deep space missions in Europe um, if we were able to develop uh, this technology. And there are various steps that are required uh, to make that technology work. The first thing to do would be to create the fuel pellets and then um, move on to uh, creating suitable structures, heat exchangers, etc., to actually operate them in orbit. Where we don't think we're likely to go um, is... Uh, uh, the use of active nuclear reactors in space. Uh, the Russians tried this with a system uh, of reactors called Topaz, which were used to power some of their radar ocean reconnaissance satellites in the past. Um, that sort of technology potentially provides um, amazing amounts of power, um, but uh, a difficulty is that you're now creating uh, a radioactive hazard in low Earth orbit. Uh, the Russians recognised that and had an ejection system that was supposed to fire the reactor out of the spacecraft at the end of life, but unfortunately on one occasion uh, the ejection system failed to operate. Uh, the satellite re-entered the Earth's atmosphere with its reactor intact. It landed in Canada and uh, the Canadians took exception to the Russians dumping radioactive debris um, on their country. And at that point, I think the Russians realized that it was politically unacceptable to do things like that.
It is a bit of a shame though because some of the most interesting um, outer solar system concepts that have been proposed over the last few years, including uh, a US mission that was also intended for Jupiter called GEMO, um, looked like an absolutely fantastic mission. And the reason it looked so impressive was because uh, it had a nuclear reactor and was able to do an awful lot with the power that it would potentially have had available. But due to political pressure, it was decided that even though the reactor wouldn't have been switched on until the mission was on its way, um, away from the Earth, um, it, the political lobby was such that they couldn't get permission to actually build this spacecraft in the first place. Obviously, once you've got power, you need to store power. Um, a lot of satellites in low Earth orbit pass in and out of the Earth's shadow. They go into eclipse, and they're not generating power directly from their solar panels. Uh, so you need to have batteries. Again, uh, the drive of techni uh, terrestrial technology is improving things from our point of view. Um, so we used to use NICAD batteries, rechargeable. Um, but now we've moved to using lithium-ion batteries, which are the sort of battery technology that you find in quite a lot of mobile phones. Um, and those batteries are more efficient. And so we have um, an improvement to the duty cycle of the missions that we're doing. Uh, we can actually switch the satellite on and have it operating for a larger proportion of its orbit as a result of these improving technologies. The satellite then has to uh, figure out which way it's pointing, so attitude determination uh, is clearly important. Um, various reference sources can be used to determine which way you're pointing. Large and obvious things like the Sun, the Earth can be used. Um, the Earth's magnetic field using uh, a magnetometer is another technique that's been widely exploited. Um, the most accurate pointing comes from using stars um, with a star camera uh, which provides you the greatest um, angular determination capability and it's even possible to use the transmissions of other satellites like GPS. If you measure the phase of the incoming signal with multiple GPS receivers uh, you can determine uh, your attitude to some level of accuracy. Having worked out which way the satellite is currently pointing, you may wish to um, orientate the satellite differently, and so you need an attitude control system to deliver that capability. Um, historically, some satellites have used very, very simple systems, like a gravity gradient boom to achieve this. This is essentially a, a long deployable boom that uh, acts a bit like a pendulum uh, in low Earth orbit. Uh, the gravitational attraction on the body of the spacecraft at the bottom is very slightly greater than the gravitational attraction at the top of the boom. And as a result, uh, a long structure like this is stable with the long axis pointing down at the Earth, uh, which is useful if you want to keep the payload uh, oriented towards the planet. Um, but the Earth isn't a perfect circle um, or a perfect sphere, and so um, the pendulum actually um, behaves a bit like uh, a terrestrial pendulum. It oscillates and um, if you don't control those oscillations you get a variation in the spacecraft's attitude by a few degrees which is tolerable if you're using a radio frequency payload um, but probably not sufficient for most imaging missions. So you need something to damp out the oscillations of the boom and uh, typically um, spacecraft have used magnetometers uh, to do this um, and magnetorkers. So you measure the Earth's magnetic field um, with a magnetometer and then you use a magnetorker which is essentially a coil of wire um, to affect the satellite's attitude. The way that you do that is you pass a current through the coil of wire. Uh, it interacts with the Earth's magnetic field and provides a turning force which you can use to damp out the oscillations of the boom. These systems, though, don't provide high precision pointing. If you want high precision pointing, you almost certainly have to go to some sort of wheelbase system. And uh, the image in the bottom left of this slide shows a group of four wheels. Uh, typically, you would have a wheel mounted um, 
uh, such that you could exercise control in each of the three axes of the spacecraft and then a fourth wheel mounted at an angle um, to give you some redundancy in the event that any of your three primary wheels were to fail. Temperature control is an important element of spacecraft design. Uh, many spacecraft are covered with uh, reflective foils to uh, avoid them getting too hot as a result of illumination by the sun. Um, clearly that applies when the satellite's in view of the sun. When the, a satellite in low Earth orbit uh, goes into the Earth's shadow, it starts to cool down. Um, satellites in low Earth orbit typically spend up to about 40 minutes in the Earth's shadow and can cool by quite significant amounts over that period of time. You can be at over 100 degrees when you're illuminated by the sun. By the time you come out of eclipse, your solar panels might have dropped to a temperature of minus 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, that necessitates making sure that that thermal cycling on the solar panels doesn't uh, get translated into thermal cycling of the spacecraft's internal electronics and uh, as a result, insulators are used to make sure that that doesn't happen. And the aim is to try and keep the internal electronics on the spacecraft within one or two degrees of room temperature, because that's typically the sort of range of temperature that the components are designed to operate in on the Earth. Orbit determination is the next challenge that you face. You need to know where your satellite is in orbit. Um, in some cases, this is done externally to the spacecraft. Um, radars or telescopes on the ground are used to track the spacecraft and determine where it is. But increasing numbers of modern satellites, especially ones in low Earth orbit, um, either transmit beacons that allow them to be uh, ranged or use GPS receivers, so they act as subscribers, mobile subscribers to uh, the GPS signal and determine their own position to an accuracy uh, that's measured in uh, single digits in metres, uh, which is uh, more precise than you can potentially track them from the ground using a radar. So uh, the knowledge of the precision of spacecraft in low Earth orbit is improving as a result of using uh, GPS and in the future um, the other navigation systems like Galileo will also be exploited to provide precision orbit knowledge. If you've determined your orbit and you've decided that the orbit isn't quite the one you want then potentially you need uh, an orbit maneuver capability and uh, this can provide, be provided by a number of different types of propulsion system. Uh, historically spacecraft have used um, fairly toxic materials like hydrazine as a propulsion system. But uh, um, in order to keep the costs down, um, it's better not to work with highly toxic um, propellants that lead you to a whole load of safety um, operations that you have to perform. So uh, we've used uh, inert gases like xenon, um, which is very safe and easy to work with. Um, essentially, our um, thrusters um, are known as resistor jets. Uh, you feed some of the propellant into um, a chamber where you heat it uh, and it's essentially a kettle-like operation. You raise the temperature of the gas, that increases its pressure so that when you release the gas the exhaust velocity is higher and you get um, a greater specific impulse from the propellant. You need to be able to tell your spacecraft what to do, so you need to be able to send it commands. And uh, most spacecraft have uh, redundant antennas on to receive commands. Um, uh, so rather like a human being with two ears, uh, a spacecraft will typically have a pair of antennas uh, on for um, receiving commands. And in particular, um, during the early phase of the mission, called the launch and early orbit phase, um, the spacecraft may not yet have stabilised itself. So you may have uh, receive antennas uh, on multiple faces of the spacecraft so that uh, it can't get into an attitude where it's unable to hear the commands that are being sent from the ground. You 
put up a satellite for a reason. Uh, it has a payload that is collecting data of some form uh, and uh, there are a variety of different types, some of which are listed on this slide. Um, in general, uh, a lot of spacecraft in low Earth orbit actually collect and store data. Um, and uh, um, the illustrations on this slide are um, a satellite that was used to investigate um, upward shooting forms of lightning that happen above thunderclouds. But clearly, there are many different applications for um, remote sensing of the Earth uh, from low Earth orbit. The trend is to uh, increasing precision, longer duty cycles, so that's uh, progressively larger um, data files to be um, processed and stored. And that's what's covered uh, on this slide. Um, as time has gone by, we have been able to get progressively larger memory devices from the terrestrial microelectronics market. Uh, we're also able to fly uh, progressively more capable processors to handle that data on board the spacecraft and maybe even uh, compress it before it's uh, sent down to the ground. Um, our satellites are essentially following Moore's law, uh, which is a law from the computer industry that says that um, processor power and memory size doubles every 18 months and uh, our satellites show a similar pace of evolution. It's no use having all the useful information that the spacecraft is uh, collected stuck on the satellite. You need to be able to get that data back down to the ground. So part of the design process for a spacecraft is to make sure that your uh, data downlink capabilities uh, are sufficient to uh, unload the spacecraft memories as the spacecraft flies over its ground station. This is particularly uh, important for satellites in low Earth orbit which may uh, pass over their ground station horizon to horizon in something less than 10 minutes. Um, so you need to either use multiple passes to get the data down or um, uh, make sure that your spacecraft has got a pretty high data rate downlink to uh, empty the memory when the satellite flies over. But the uh, there are solutions to this particular limitation and what I'll be talking about later is uh, laser communications and intersatellite links which are two ways uh, that satellites in the future will um, get over this particular limitation of the design. And finally, a spacecraft needs protection against the radiation environment that it'll see uh, in orbit. Um, terrestrial microelectronics are not designed in general to uh, accommodate a high radiation environment um, and when we want to take terrestrial microelectronics into orbit and expose them to the particles trapped in the Van Allen radiation belts and to cosmic rays uh, we need to think about uh, how we handle that. Um, in the case of the relatively low energy particles that come out off the Sun, the protons and electrons, we can generally shield those out using um, metal boxes around the components, which is what's illustrated here. Uh, the much higher energy cosmic rays that are generated well outside the solar system are uh, a different sort of problem. It's very hard to shield against those. And as a result, uh, we tend to try and handle their effects um, in software. So um, a an incoming cosmic ray might create what we refer to as a single event upset, a corruption of a memory state which moves the, the memory state from a one to zero or vice versa. And we typically use um, majority voting on the spacecraft to resolve this. We would collect data, write it into three separate memory locations and then routinely compare the data in those three memory locations to make sure that it is still the same. If an incoming cosmic ray has caused a corruption in one of those memories, um, we'll be able to identify it and correct it before the data is transmitted to the ground.